Buonasera a tutti, siamo qui per la seconda parte del Glocal CIS Biotech, eh, è il nostro ultimo appuntamento e quindi anche l'occasione di ringraziare i laboratori dal basso per questa importante opportunità che ci ha dato, di invitare eh, persone che nel settore del food biotech e in settori affini e limitrofi ci potessero in qualche modo arricchire con le loro esperienze e le loro competenze. Uh, nel, Glocal Food, uh, nel Glocal Cheese Biotech stamattina abbiamo avuto un'esperienza dalla principale multinazionale del settore che è la Christian Hansen e invece oggi pomeriggio abbiamo l'aspetto più locale nell'ambito del quale ospitiamo Catherine Donnelly dell'Università del Vermont è una, è una presenza importante perché è sia una rappresentante universitaria sia rappresenta un centro di ricerca invece sui formaggi artigianali con la quale lei collabora e nel, stand, passando un po' di tempo assieme già ho avuto modo di ehm, vedere come eh, la rilevanza della ricerca e sviluppo anche nel settore delle produzioni locali è cruciale il grant più grande che lei ha avuto dal, dallo Stato americano non è stato eh, sui patogeni che pure è una, una tematica che lei eh, diciamo possiede da tanto tempo quanto invece sulle innovazioni per i piccoli produttori perché è lì la chiave anche negli Stati Uniti d'America per ragioni che riguardano i fattori produttivi e l'occupazione ed è praticamente poi la tematica che interessa il nostro laboratorio per cui vi lascio alla professoressa che ringrazio thank you very much thank you is it okay sitting down I'm okay I'm just going to be comfortable great It's very nice to be here. Um, Foggia is a lovely place and it's a real honor to be here. So I'm going to do a few things this afternoon. We're going to talk about Listeria first because it's a very important organism that will have impacts on Italy and the cheeses here. Cheeses are emerging as an important source of human infection. So we're going to talk about the problem and then how we can address the problem. Then I'll show you another presentation on how we apply our basic knowledge of listeria to actually um, getting into plants with high-risk cheeses. I'll um, then talk about the Vermont Institute for Artisan Cheese, how our university addressed the needs of the artisan cheese community. And then in the last, I'll talk about some models for entrepreneurship, how you can take science and technology and put it into forming small businesses that can be engines for economic growth. So, Listeria. I'm going to overview Listeria and some public health concerns. Um, I literally just came back from a conference last week in India that it's a conference on Listeria that meets every three years, and so we'll talk about some of the current knowledge. We'll look at current research And then we'll look at some of the United States regulatory activity. The Food Safety Modernization Act will have a large impact on Italy, on Europe, on any country that's manufacturing cheese. And so we'll go through those implications. At the outset, I'll talk a little bit about the Vermont Institute for Artisan Cheese, or VIAC. Um, we formed this institute to facilitate national and international scientific policy discussions that surround cheese safety, global trade, regulations, the research needs and all of that, and with a particular focus on the needs of the small-scale artisans. Most of our regulations in the United States and in other countries are written for the very large companies but they apply to the smallest of the small people who don't have scientific backgrounds, they don't understand the regulations, and so it's our job as scientists to translate that complicated science in a way that small producers can understand the regulations and make good products that comply with those. Now, I want to give you a sense of the emerging trends in the U.S. artisan industry. And last night at dinner, we had a discussion on, for the longest time, that the pendulum that swings back and forth, right? The pendulum has swung to the large growth model, large modern industries that are big. 
It's now swinging away because of economic realities, and especially in the United States, to favor the small artisan, kind of the slow food model that um, Italy has, has um, been a large um, source of inspiration, creation for that model. So what's happening in the United States where there's growth in cheese it's in the small artisan industry. And you can see a breakdown. We received a USDA grant to take a look at trends in the artisan cheese industry. And you'll see um, almost every state around the United States has the emergence of these small scale cheese makers who are producing regional products. It's a, it's a very European type of model, but it's unusual for the United States because we've been predominated by industrial scale cheese making. We surveyed this population of, of all cheese makers basically and found that with nearly 75% of cheese businesses identified as farmstead, so they own the animals on their farm and make products from, from that farmstead. This raises important questions about product quality and consistency, food safety, sanitation, and hygiene. And so promoting food safety will be key to sustaining the growth that we've experienced over the last 10 years in this important industry. And so what are the risks that artisan cheesemakers um, need, especially the farmstead, because when you have a proximity of animals to your production, there's just a higher risk. And so the pathogens are of concern include Salmonella typhimurium DT104 and Salmonella newport. Those strains of Salmonella carry multiple antibiotic resistance genes, and so when they cause infections, they're very serious infections. Listeria monocytogenes, we'll talk a lot about that organism. E. coli 0157H7 and other shigatoxin producing strains of E. coli, everybody's nodding, you have the problems in Italy just like we do. And Staphylococcus aureus, which historically has been an important pathogen in cheese. And so we have to manage these risks to prevent outbreaks of illness. And that involves, in part, developing microbiological criteria for raw milk that's um, aged for, that's destined for aged raw milk cheese making. In Europe, you have really good tools. You have the EU microbiological criteria that's doing a very good job at addressing, managing these risks. In the United States, if cheese doesn't, if, if milk doesn't meet the microbiological standards to be pasteurized for fluid milk consumption, it's diverted to cheese making. It's a real problem. So you have a much better model than we do. Now, what about listeria? This is a leading cause of death from a foodborne pathogen in the United States. Most foodborne pathogens make you really sick and you wish that you would die, but you usually don't and you recover and you're fine. But that's not true with listeria. It's a very rare cause of illness. And so the current US incidence, there are only two to three cases per 100,000 persons. And that translates into you know, roughly 1,600 cases per year in the United States. That's not a lot. But those 1,600 cases result in 250 deaths a year, and that's very significant. The good news, most of the time when we work in public health, despite everything you know about pathogens like salmonella, every year there are more and more and more cases, and so you never address how to reduce those cases. That hasn't been true with listeria. And so during my career, I've worked at the university for 30 years, we've seen a precipitous decline in cases because of the good research and knowledge we have on how to address this pathogen. So it's a risk that can be managed. A 35% reduction in cases between 1996 and 2002 is really significant. So again, you see the organism. So we have two networks in the United States that compile disease statistics. One is called FoodNet. It's, it's a site maintained by the Centers for Disease Control, and it conducts active surveillance of about um, 15 million people in the United States. So it gives us really good information on who's getting sick and from what organisms. And then we have another network called PulseNet, 
where we do pulse field gel electrophoresis typing of the isolates from clinical cases so we get a good idea of which strains are causing illness where and can use that to track back sources. So it's a really sophisticated network. So what you see from FoodNet, despite the, I don't know how many cases of salmonellosis are reported in the US, maybe 2 million cases per year. Of those 2 million cases, there are 378 deaths. Contrast that with listeria, 1,600 cases results in 255 deaths. And so listeria, even though it's rare, it receives a lot of attention because of that um, fact. Now, who is at risk? Not everybody is at risk for acquiring listeriosis. So everybody in this room, we're healthy, we have functional immune systems, not a problem for us. However, um, the elderly, as you age, your immune system is less effective, and in the recent outbreaks, it's almost exclusively the elderly that are succumbing to this illness. Pregnant women, the fetus is very vulnerable um, to infection. Listeria can cross the placental barrier, and so an infected mother can pass that organism along to her fetus. Um, Persons that are um, having some sort of immunosuppressive therapy, either transplant patients, they've received a transplanted organ, cancer patients, those with autoimmune disorders, diabetes is one of the risk factors, um, and certainly persons with HIV AIDS are all at risk. Think about that immunocompromised population though. It's growing as a percentage of our population. How many people in here know someone that has cancer? It's like almost all of us in this room could put up our hand, right? That probably wasn't true 20 or 30 years ago. So what is happening now, we keep saying, oh, well, it's just the high-risk consumers, but the high-risk consumers might account for at least a third of our population. So it's a significant group that we have to address their safety needs. So what we've done in my lab group is um, address a lot of the, the data gaps. There's a lot that's known about industrial scale cheeses. Most of the milk for those cheeses is pasteurized, and so there's really not a concern. In the United States, our Food and Drug Administration is the regulatory body that, that regulates cheese safety, and they're just obsessed with raw milk. Um, they don't like the use of raw milk in cheese making, um, and it's a misunderstanding because um, it, it, it makes raw milk cheeses appear to have a higher level of risk. What's very interesting is most of the outbreaks that have happened over the last 10 years have involved cheeses made from pasteurized milk. And so that's a different approach to managing the risk than just banning raw milk cheese. And I think a lot of focus of the FDA on banning raw milk cheese making, why would, what would be a good reason? If we banned raw milk cheese making, no more PDO cheeses, no more AOC cheeses, we do the protectionism, block the border, and it, it's not accurate science. And so some of the things we've done in my lab is look at what is the microbiological profile for raw milk used for cheese making, and does listeria emerge as a problem in this milk? And so in 2008, we did a study, collected raw milk samples weekly between June and September from 11 farmstead cheese operations. Between June and September is when the temperature is warm, like today, and you'd have the highest risk. As has been confirmed all over the world, the main pathogen of concern is Staph aureus. We detected that in 46 of our 133 milk samples from eight farms, and so almost everybody has a problem with Staph. Listeria, however, only three out of 133 milk samples, very low incidence of Listeria, and two of those samples were from the same farm. And so raw milk really is not a good source of listeria. And so these arguments of our regulatory bodies, oh, raw milk's a problem, that's not what the science says. E. coli 0157H7 was only recovered from one sample, and no salmonella was found in any samples. Um, and so again, the survey was repeated in 2008 
This time, two years later, Staph aureus was the only pathogen recovered from any raw milk samples, allowing us to conclude that raw, most raw milk intended for farmstead cheesemaking is of high microbiological quality with a low incidence of pathogens. Farmstead cheesemakers tend to have small herds of animals. They carefully manage those animals. They address the health concerns, and um, they're in pretty good shape. Now, again, going back to the federal regulations, again, the Food and Drug Administration dictates um, categories of cheeses and rules that apply to those cheeses. And not being cynical, but our Food and Drug Administration doesn't really understand cheese and we're helping to educate them, and it's taking a lot of time and effort, but we're, we're doing a good job. So for instance, we have a section, the Code of Federal Regulations, you can, you can access this on a website, has a section that deals with soft ripened cheeses, and another section that deals with semi-soft cheese, and these are high moisture cheeses, we have a rule called the 60-day aging rule. You can do two things if you're a, a cheesemaker in the United <coughs> States. You can either pasteurize your milk for cheesemaking to achieve safety, or you can age your cheese for 60 days. And the theory is over those 60 days, your pathogens drop off in levels to those that aren't of concern to human health, and you're done with it. But that's not true with a soft-ripened cheese. And ironically, the 60-day aging regulation applies to a soft ripened cheese, which is crazy for reasons that I'll show you. And so we've tried to gently publish papers that show the FDA that the 60 day aging rule applied to a soft ripened cheese like a camembert is creating more of a hazard than it's trying to control the hazard. So you see this graph, if you inoculate milk um, with listeria and make a cheddar cheese, you know what cheddar cheese is, it's a, it, it's a fairly dry English style cheese, and so it has a lot of acidity, a lot of salt, and Listeria doesn't like that environment, and so it declines in population. That cheese doesn't support the growth of Listeria. Unlike a soft ripened cheese like a camembert, if you start with one or 10 Listeria cells at the end of 60 days of aging, you have about 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 8th listeria, enough to really cause human illness. So the 60-day aging rule just isn't working for these cheeses. And so we use this information to suggest to our regulators, you know, instead of impugning raw milk cheese, maybe you should go back and address your own regulations that just don't make any sense in terms of managing risk. And we do this in a nice way. We're all friends, but, you know, they don't really like you pointing out the fact that their regulations are really bad. So the other thing we do at the university is um, try and help um, cheesemakers manage these risks. Many of our artisan cheesemakers, and I have a presentation that will address this a little later on, but most of the people making artisan cheese in the United States are not scientists. They don't have the education and training that all of you do. They've been bankers, they've been um, lawyers, they, you know, they're, they've been TV personalities, and they all want to buy animals and make cheese. And from a microbiological standpoint, that's a little bit risky. And so what we do is try and do risk management programs. And so we, the first risk management program we did, we enrolled 16 farmstead cheesemakers and told them, we're gonna go to your farm, we're gonna do a microbiological audit, we'll take swabs, swab all of your facilities, um, see if we find sources of pathogens, take a look at your milk, and then armed with that data, we'll make recommendations, and then we'll come back and do that all over again and see if we can control your risk. And so, as our previous data had shown, Staph aureus is the most common pathogen that you isolate from raw milk. But from an environmental perspective, when you look at the cheesemaking environment, you start isolating listeria from environmental sites, including floors and drains, milk cans, crates. And so you've really got to put focus on keeping that environment um, really clean. This slide is a little hard to see, but at the beginning, at, you see drains, floor drains, where water drains down. 
either in the production room or the aging room. In the production room, 34% of the drains were positive for listeria. And you might say, oh, so what? It's in a drain. It's not you know, on a surface. What happens when you pour water down a drain? You get aerosols, right? And the organisms travel, and they deposit on surfaces. And so now you have a contaminated plant. So you've really got to address the sanitation in drains. It's very, very important. Um, when drains back up and they start flooding the floor, then the floor becomes contaminated. Then people that walk on the floor carry that contamination everywhere. And before you know it, listeria is everywhere. And if you want to make a cheese that doesn't contain listeria, you've got to get rid of the contamination in your plant. It's that simple. We also use um, a molecular technology ribotyping, to, looking at um, the DNA and the 16 sRNA region to figure out, OK, of these listeria monocytogenes strains that are everywhere, can we see some patterns? Is there one strain contaminating a plant? Are there many strains? And so you, you um, take a look at the, the ribotype profiles of these organisms, and you look for relatedness. And you'll see in red the DUP1042. That's a particularly persistent strain of listeria. That strain caused an outbreak in, for, related to Vermont milk back in 1983. This is 30 years ago. That strain is still persistent in the environment. Once it gets established, it's really, really hard to get rid of. And so you've really got to manage these risks. So again, armed with this data, this is the type of data that we share with cheesemakers. And we say, look, here's your plant. These are all the sites that are contaminated. You've got to get busy cleaning and sanitizing. If you do, you've got to alter traffic patterns. Maybe you shouldn't let people wander all over your plant. You've got to you know, keep the doors closed, deny entry to persons so you don't have that spread. So we make all of those recommendations, and then we go back and do the microbiological audit again. And we found that corrective action, either altering traffic patterns, operating procedures to eliminate cross-contamination, was effective as the pathogen was eliminated from the contaminated sites. So you can do something to eliminate this organism. And results from our 2009 risk reduction program revealed that good manufacturing practices, the basics that you should be doing when you're making any food, um, just employee practices, no bare hand contact or use of good sanitation, that was critically lacking in many of our um, small scale cheese making operations. And so we had to go back to the basics with these producers. Now, we did another series of risk reduction programs because, you know, this problem just isn't going to go away. It'll be researched for a long, long time. We um, enrolled 10 different cheesemakers this time. And again, the technical team spends a total of two days with each cheesemaker. On day one, they do a comprehensive review of the cheesemaking process, everything from milking to aging. The intake allows us to do um, a comprehensive flow sheet of the cheese making process. And then we use a hazards analysis, critical control points. Do you all know what that is? A, a system to evaluate the hazards and figure out where your control points are going to be. So we use this flow diagram to identify those CCPs. We looked at the type of cheese that was being manufactured, an assessment of risk. Is it a cheese that supports the growth of listeria? That's high risk. Doesn't support the growth of listeria? That's lower risk. We did physical notes from the structural facility, the condition, the layout, the traffic flow. Then we watched the cheese makers making cheese. Um, and a system for achieving process control was put in place by identifying the key parameters needing routine measurement during cheese making. Simple things such as measuring pH, most of the cheesemakers aren't doing that. Um, you'd look at their production records and titratable acidity. Well, your cheese is supposed to have this, this level of titratable acidity. It's way over here. When, when did that change occur? We don't know. We don't measure that. And so we worked with them to make sure they put these controls in place. 
We also collected microbiological samples. If you want people to change, there's no better way to get their attention than to give them data from their own production facility. Suddenly, they could have something to relate to. We looked at milk, curds, whey, and finished cheese. We did standard plate counts. We looked at coliform levels, somatic cell counts in the milk. And then we looked at the target pathogens, Listeria, Salmonella, E. coli, and Staphylococcus aureus. We also went and swabbed the environment, um, looking at floor drains, floors, vats, tables, carts, squeegees, and floor mops. Many times the tools that you're using to clean and sanitize are the sources of Listeria. That's a bad problem. And then data from the microbiological analysis, again, is shared with the cheesemaker and recommendations made for focus on critical cheesemaking areas. Um, as I said, the GMPs are really lacking many times, and so we'll address the need for protective clothing, such as gowns, hairnets, gloves. Hand washing and sanitation was absent in many facilities. Implementation of hygienic zoning, again, to keep people out of the pr critical production area, as well as improvements in milk quality. And then we leave it up to the cheesemaker, depending on how much resource they have, if and how the recommendations can be implemented. And then we go back after they implement changes. And on the second visit, cheesemaking is again conducted in the presence of our technical team. Um, and we compare data between visit one and visit two to determine if the recommendations um, have resulted in risk reduction, improved process control, and improvements in cheese safety and quality. The nice thing about this plan is the safety plans that we develop can then serve as the basis of written food safety plans that all of our cheesemakers, both here, both in the United States as well as anybody that exports product to the United States, everybody's going to have to have a written food safety plan. And so this type of work is the first step in developing those written food safety plans to meet the FDA Food Safety Modernization Act. Has anyone in this room heard about the Food Safety Modernization Act? Scott has, that's good. We're going to talk about that because it's going to have a major impact on global trade. This was a way to modernize our food safety regulations in the United States that all have historical roots and don't, frankly don't work very well. So this was signed into law by President Obama on January 4th, 2011. It focuses the Food and Drug Administration on prevention of foodborne illness. What we do right now is largely react to outbreaks. Oh my God, someone's getting sick, what do we do? This is going to say, no, 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 no. We're not going to wait to go back and investigate that there's a real disaster waiting to happen. We're going to focus everybody on making sure that outbreak doesn't happen. What this law has done is given the Food and Drug Administration new enforcement authorities to achieve higher rates of compliance with prevention and risk-based food safety standards and to better respond to problems. And when I'm dealing with my students, how I explain compliance, today we were driving down the highway with Vittorio, right? And he's kind of speeding along until he sees the police on the side. Oh, then he's going to slow down to the speed limit. That's compliance, right? And so everybody in the factories making food does a lot better job with safety when the police are there watching what they're doing. What we hope is we can change behavior so there isn't the need for the policemen for all of us to comply with the laws, right? This is international. We can all relate to this. Um, the, what's important for everybody in this room, FDA has new tools to hold imported foods to the same standards as domestic foods. And with respect to cheese, now we're getting into some territory that makes me really, really nervous because you just saw how the FDA doesn't really understand cheese to begin with. Um, and some of the traditional practices and maybe the tools that are used aren't going to conform to our regulations. And what are we going to do about all of this? There's lots of work to do. Um, what this law does is direct FDA to build an integrated national food safety system in partnership with state and local authorities as well as internationally. 
So one of the first things that this law requires is the establishment of records. And there's a section of our Bioterrorism Act that amends the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which is our big law that deals with food protection. It adds a section which provides FDA with the authority to access records if they have a belief that there's been adulteration or there's a threat of serious adverse health consequences or death to humans and animals. Prior to this law, all of the records of a company were very much protected as their business information. No more. All the records are going to be accessible. Huge change. FDA's also added a new section that FDA may establish requirements for establishment and maintenance of records by persons who manufacture, process, pack, transport, distribute, receive, um, hold, or import food. So again, all of our, um, I'll use cheese importers as an example, they all have to maintain records and all of those records can be accessed. In terms of import requirements, they're closely tied to preventive controls and produce safety requirements. Um, they call for a fundamental paradigm shift. Instead of the FDA inspector who detects and corrects problems at the port of entry, so you ship Gorgonzola, for instance, to New York, and an inspector looks and doesn't like what he sees and refuses the, to um, allow the importation of the Gorgonzola, the Food Safety Modernization Act makes importers accountable for verifying that the food's been produced in accordance with U.S. standards or under modern preventive controls that provide um, the same level of public health protection. So that puts the onus on people in other countries that want to export food to the United States. Importers must manage the supply chains to ensure the safety of imported foods. And a lot of that is going on now, but this law makes that a lot more clear. What I did, so FDA is, it has established um, offices in Europe, and now they're actively going into processing facilities um, in Italy and France. And here is a typical warning letter. I chose one that was written to a French um, cheese company. The beauty of the United States government, almost everything is transparent. You can access these warning letters just by going online. And so if you have an, want an idea of what they look like, you can access them. This particular warning letter to a French firm says, your firm does not use plant equipment materials, namely the foam rubber type material used with the pressure plates that allow for adequate cleaning to comply with 21 CFR part 110 specifically the pressure plates that are used to compress cheese curds within the equipment used to form the cheese have lower pad surfaces that are made of foam rubber type material in which our investigators observe small pores. These pads make contact with the top of the cheese as pressure is applied. The top of the equipment is made in part of a fine screen material, thus exposing the cheese curds within the equipment to potential microbial contamination from the foam rubber type material underneath the pressure plates. Although you conduct periodic testing for listeria species in your cheese products, you are still required under the good manufacturing regulations to only use materials that can be adequately cleaned and sanitized. So FDA's put this firm on notice. What other material is widely used in Europe for cheese making that can't be cleaned and sanitized? Anybody? Wood? Do we use a lot of wood in cheese making here? Our traditional practices, some of the vats, the shelves to age cheese, doesn't comply with our regulations, and I have no idea what's going to happen with all of that. It's going to be very interesting. Um, big potential for problems. Now, what is, what is compelling FDA? Unfortunately, they're obsessed right now with a focus on cheese, and why is that? They did um, a Listeria surveillance initiative in the United States. They conducted surveys of the environments, the same ones my team did, and what was interesting is there were FDA inspectors actively working in my little state of Vermont at the time that we were doing all of our research. And the good news, in most of the instances, our technical team had reached the cheesemaker before the FDA came to visit. 
And so we've got through all the recommendations and the corrections. So the FDA gets there and they're like, wow, you guys are doing a great job. Where did you get all of your information? And so you always want to be ahead of this curve instead of, instead of the FDA finding what we found. But they went in and did a big survey across the United States, 154 plants total, 41 artisan cheese producers. 31% of the plants that they tested had positive environmental findings for Listeria monocytogenes. And so that just proved to them that there's a problem and they need to do more focus on this industry. In 2013 to date, FDA has found Listeria in 23% of the plants that they looked at, both large and small, doesn't matter. Um, they'll, in FY 2013 this year, they'll conduct inspection of 264 facilities, all cheese, mostly artisanal, and compliance of artisan facilities and practices with 21 CFR um, will be what they're going to be analyzing. Now we said to the FDA, but you know what, you don't really need to do this analysis and especially I've told you they were kind of obsessed with um, raw milk cheese and especially imported cheese. And so they're, you know, they've got all these big plans in place and we said, but you're already sitting on all of this data. They had done a domestic and imported cheese compliance program in the United States. It was started back in 1998. The objective of this program was FDA inspection of domestic cheese firms, examine samples of domestic and imported cheese for microbiological contamination. The target pathogens are the same ones that we've already talked about. Um, now FDA has had this data for, what, 12 years? And so we, the nice thing you can do as a citizen of the United States is under the Freedom of Information Act, you can make a request for all of those test results and they have to give them to you. And so we asked with an attorney for those data and then we analyzed them to prove to them that um, the PDO and AOC cheeses made from raw milk really weren't that much of a problem compared to everything else. So we only got three years of data, but you can see in um, FY04, domestic cheese, 1.45% um, of it was positive for listeria, six out of 412 samples that they looked at. Two hard cheeses had listeria, one Mexican style, the Hispanic style soft cheeses are a real problem in our country, one soft ripened and one semi-soft. For the FY04 imported cheeses, 11 Mexican style soft cheeses. Um, the Hispanic style soft cheeses are a, a huge source of listeria in our country. If you look at 2005, the numbers went down. Only five Mexican style soft cheeses, one domestic blue cheese. And then in FY06, um, again, two cheeses domestically and only three cheeses that were imported. Um, one of those was a gorgonzola cheese from Italy. But it does show you that once you impose regulations, people tend to comply with those regulations, and so there's been a good track record. Now, the US government has been working with Health Canada, so right to the north of the United States is Canada, and that border is the largest trading border in the world. And um, the Canadian approach is much more like Europe than the United States regulations. And so it was a good first attempt to see how we can harmonize regulations. So they did a joint um, public health risk assessment, assessing the public health impact of listeria in specifically soft ripened cheese for reasons that I've shown you, it carries more risk. The assessment will include focus on sources of contamination, effects of individual manufacturing or processing steps, and the effectiveness of intervention strategies, including new processing technologies. It evaluates the effect of factors such as the microbiological status of milk, the impact of cheese manufacturing steps on listeria levels, conditions during distribution and storage on the overall risk of invasive listeriosis to the consumer, um, following the consumption of soft ripened cheese. 
The risk assessment will also evaluate the effectiveness of some process changes and in intervention strategies in reducing the risk of human illness. So moving forward, what's interesting, there was a joint risk assessment until it came to recommendations. And then Canada said, well, we're going in this direction and the United States went in a different direction. So what did Health Canada decide to do with the same data that gen was generated by this risk assessment? They identified several elements that could be incorporated into an updated policy for soft and sem semi-soft cheeses made from unpasteurized milk. Possible elements, some of which would require regulatory amendments, include no longer requiring 60 days of aging. The Canadians are like, why would you age a cheese way, you know, a soft ripened cheese was never meant to be eaten at 60 days, right? The peak of, of flavor, cheese is beautiful at 30 days. Why would you arbitrarily hold it for 30 more days? To meet a regulation that doesn't make any scientific sense and puts a population at risk. And so Health Canada said, we're not gonna do that. What we're gonna do is no longer require that 60 days of aging, but we are gonna establish microbiological criteria for the milk used in the production of unpasteurized soft and semi-soft cheeses. We're gonna update the existing microbiological criteria for cheese. We're gonna require record keeping to support enforcements, develop an education campaign for consumers, so keep the high-risk consumers away from a high-risk product, and also de develop mandatory labeling requirements so consumers know if they're consuming a raw milk soft ripened cheese and then they can make their own decisions. So in 2011, um, Health Canada was focused on, again, the four pathogens we've been talking about, Staph, E. coli, Listeria, and Salmonella. Um, what they've done with their proposed microbiological criteria is establish upper limits for staph and E. coli. Again, based on all of our data, those are the two pathogens that um, have carry some risk in terms of prevalence in milk, and you can facilitate controls with the philosophy being, if you can keep staph levels down, the measures that you're using to do that probably take care of a lot of other problems as well. And so those regulations um, make a lot of good sense. So what are the conclusions? The Food Safety Modernization Act will have a major impact on the artisan cheese industry worldwide. Cheesemakers need to understand the risks that they're required to mitigate, and there's a lot of education for all of us to do. Education and mitigation efforts are critical, and being proactive is key. And so it's a way that your university, an example of a program that you could implement to work with your local and regional cheesemakers. And then the other thing I want to leave you with is the way the United States government works. Um, that, and it makes this whole cheese debate really more interesting. So back in 2002, our um, Congress decided it would be a good idea to refine what pastor redefine what pasteurization was. So instead of the time temperature targets that are used worldwide, our US Congress, because they're so qualified to do this, there's not, well, well there might be one or two scientists among them. They're, they're not a scientific body. They decided they'd redefine what pasteurization was can anyone think of a reason that we'd redefine pasteurization? So in our country, um, a technology that the food industry really wanted to push on people was a radiation technology that's perfectly safe, um, does a good job in destroying pathogens, but there's no consumer acceptance of that. So someone got to a member of Congress, did their lobbying, and said, well, if we just change the definition of what pasteurization is to include irradiation, then there's no need to rate, label products as being irradiated. Right now, you have to put the Regura symbol on there, and no consumer wants to buy a product with that symbol on there. No problem, we'll redefine pasteurization. So they hid this in a marketing bill. It went to the floor of, con this is all, I'm not making this up, this is amazing. Went to, went to the floor like it, in the middle of the night, like two in the morning, 
And so now we have a new definition of pasteurization, but it's actually a good one for cheese. Any process, treatment, or combination thereof that is applied to food to reduce the most resistant microorganisms of public health significance to a level that's not likely to present a public health risk under normal conditions of distribution and storage. So Parmigiano Reggiano, for instance, made with raw milk, but it's long aged, high salt, high acidity, you know, Parmigiano Reggiano is bomb proof. Listeria is not going to grow in that product. And so you could apply this definition of pasteurization, or at least what you have to do is petition the FDA that here's my process and um, I want approval that the way that we make Parmigiano Reggiano complies with reducing pathogens of public health concern that levels to levels that aren't of public health significance. What's interesting is the FDA's forgotten all about this like redefinition. And so whenever we're changing regulations, there's a public comment period. And so I keep writing into public comments, but wait a second, we don't use the old definition of pasteurization, just a heat treatment of milk. It's more comprehensive than that. So it, it's gonna be a very complicated um, type of debate as we change um, our system. So that gives you a little bit of background about listeria. And now we'll move into how we apply this knowledge when we're looking at um, certain high-risk cheese products. So for instance, the washed rind cheeses carry a little more risk than, um, than something like a, any kind of cooked um, or hard cheese. And so again, the same pathogens that we've talked about that pose a risk to cheese safety, and a little of this will be redundant, but you'll see how we apply it in an educational workshop. Um, we go through why listeria is a, a problem in terms of deaths and the high-risk consumers. Um, there was some good work that came out of France to look at relative susceptibility of high-risk consumers. And so right at the top of risk are people that have received transplanted organs when you've had a kidney transplant or a liver transplant. For the rest of your life, you're given immunosuppressive drugs so you don't reject that organ. That makes you about 2,500 more times um, susceptible to listeria infection than a person who has no underlying symptoms. The same thing with people that are suffering from leukemia, a blood cancer you have about 1,300 times the risk of acquiring listeriosis as a normal healthy person. The problem is people that have leukemia don't know that. We haven't done a really good job in getting the word out. Again, persons with AIDS. Um, what's interesting, persons with diabetes emerging as a public health problem around the world, no one thinks about someone that's diabetic as having a higher risk for listeria. Many people that have diabetes, don't even, they're undiagnosed, they don't know about it. Again, they have 30 times the risk as the normal consumer for listeria specifically. So again, we talked about the 60-day aging rule and the two options that our government gives. If you look at when this regulation was promulgated back in 1950, um, in our country, at that time, the only cheese that was being made, there was one kind, cheddar cheese, right? And I have a colleague who's in Ragusa, Sicily, Giuseppe La Chitra, and when he comes to lecture in the United States, he'll have the beautiful map of Italy and all the regional cheeses, and then he'll show a map of the United States, and every state says cheddar, cheddar, cheddar. And so, unfortunately, all of our cheese regulations, going back to that date, only apply to one type of cheese. Now that the, all the artisans have emerged and they're making all different types of cheese, our regulations are way behind what's happening with respect to cheese making. Now when you do risk assessments, the best way to look at where the risk is is to take a look at where the problems have occurred. And so you go back and look at outbreak data. And what you find when you examine outbreaks compared to other food commodities, so ground beef in our country, huge source of microbiological problems, fresh bag salads, salad greens are, have caused lots and lots of outbreaks. Fresh produce in general is responsible for lots of outbreaks. 
But cheese really isn't as a commodity. It has a really good track record. Between 1980 and 1996, there were only 30 known outbreaks linked to cheese in the US, Canada, and Europe. Most other industries would be thrilled if they had that track record for one year, let alone that sustained time period. And so, uh, you know, and I believe all of the things we do for phage control, we talked a little bit about this last night, we clean and sanitize our environments. Those measures, to a large extent, take care of a lot of the pathogens. What's interesting is the outbreaks, as I mentioned before, aren't exclusive to raw milk. Most of them are caused by cheese that's been made for pasteurized milk. And so there's this artificial concern about raw milk cheese that isn't borne out by the scientific data. Um, pathogens involved in the outbreaks have included the four we've talked about, along with Brucella and Yersinia and Aerocolitica. Um, in the United States, unfortunately, we've seen several very large outbreaks involving listeria, 284 illnesses and 88 deaths, almost exclusively linked to Hispanic-style soft cheeses. And that's a particular, it's an ethnic cheese. Most of that cheese is made in unlicensed facilities. It's not made using good manufacturing practices. The Food and Drug Administration calls it bathtub cheese because many times it's made in the home in a bathtub. That's the cheese fat. It, there's no cleaning and sanitizing. It's sold by door-to-door -door vendors, no refrigeration. It's a disaster. It's a real disaster. Um, and so we're, we're trying to you know, get rid of um, that type of cheese making. Since 1996, we've seen periodic outbreaks of listeria in cheese. There have been four in Europe, four in the US, and one in Canada. But again, you look at Le Noir's um, cheese classification, you see a very differential risk. You can't just say cheese is at risk. The soft ripened or fresh cheeses carry much more of a risk compared to the hard cooked cheeses like a Parmigiana Reggiana, right? So there's a whole continuum of risk. When we look at um, washed rind cheeses specifically, um, these are surface bacteria ripened cheeses, referred to as the smear ripened cheeses. They include cheeses like Limburger, Telegio, Epoise, Munster. They're washed with a brine solution or smear to promote the development of a viscous red-orange microbial consortium that's composed of bacteria and yeast. The surface growth of that community um, causes the cheese pH to increase from about 5 to where pathogens are controlled up to pH 7, which then enables the growth of salt-tolerant bacterial pathogens like listeria to very, very high levels. So you're creating a very favorable environment for listeria. Washing with a brine solution represents a major means of contamination and cross-contamination with listeria. And so when outbreaks have occurred, many times you know, the brine solution is positive for listeria, the brushes or um, sponges used for the washing. So you have a contaminated brine, what happens to all the good cheese? Well, contaminated as you're smearing this culture. Vacheron Montdor, are you familiar with this outbreak? Very interesting listeria outbreak. It's a seasonal cheese um, available only between October and March. It's a wonderful, wonderful cheese. It's made from cow's milk fed on an autumn diet of sweet hay. It's got a soft, runny interior enclosed in an orange-pink rind. And then it's wrapped with a band of spruce bark from the farmer's own cheeses. So it's a real beautiful artisan cheese. It's made in the Jura in, on both the French and Swiss sides of um, the border. And this particular um, cheese caused a big outbreak of listeria that went on for several years before epidemiologists were able to figure out what was happening. So this occurred in Switzerland between 1983 and 1987. Um, and there was an increase of cases during the winter months, again, correlated with when this cheese was seasonally available. In total, there were 122 cases of illness. 65 cases occurred in pregnant women and neonates. 57 cases in non-pregnant adults. There were 30 deaths due to this cheese. 
There were four different clinical subtypes of Listeria monocytogenes 4B involved. So when I showed you the ribotype patterns, there were four different cases. Whenever you see more than one um, epidemic clone involved in an outbreak, it always indicates environmental contamination. And that was true in this case. Um, the people that were infected, the, the good news about listeria, if you acquire a listeria infection, you get really, really sick very fast. A lot of central nervous system, um, meningitis, your brain gets infected. So you usually go and seek medical attention. So that's the good news. And if there's early intervention, most of the cases can survive. Um, again, this is a cheese produced during the winter months, Western Switzerland and in France. Um, it's been made for two centuries. It's produced from raw milk in France. The Swiss began producing cheese from pasteurized milk in 1983 in an effort to better control production and ripening. The problem is if you have contamination from your environment, Listeria doesn't care whether you've used pasteurized milk or raw milk, it makes no difference. It's all gonna get contaminated. So the cheese involved in this outbreak was made by 40 different producers. So imagine being an epidemiologist and trying to place together what happened. Um, following coagulation of milk, curd was dipped into wooden hoops and allowed to drain for one to two days. And then the cheese was ripened in one of 12 caves for three weeks prior to packaging for sale. But it wasn't uncommon during the ripening for cheeses to be um, transferred among the different caves that were doing the ripening. So even if your cave was nice and clean, if you received a, a you know, lot of contaminated cheese from another cave, so suddenly your cave becomes contaminated. The hoops used for the cheese production were returned to different producers and reused without any disinfection, facilitating dissemination of the contaminants. And in follow-up investigations, half of the cellars were contaminated with one or both of the epidemic subtypes of listeria. So this is like the worst case scenario for contamination. What was great is instead of just banning the production of this cheese, there are a lot of people in Europe that love this cheese. It's a wonderful cheese. There was implementation of a rigorous cleaning and sanitation program, along with utilization of more easily cleaned equipment, and it was highly effective in ending the outbreak. And so it shows that you can manage the risks and produce product that um, has a low risk. Between 2009 and 2010, there was another outbreak in, linked to an Austrian cheese called Quargel. Are you familiar with this outbreak, if you talked a little bit about this? Between June of 2009 and February of 2010, invasive listeriosis affected 34 persons and caused eight deaths. It didn't take six years, though, to put together this outbreak. Why? Because Europe, just like the United States, has gone to an active surveillance network, and it's making a big difference in terms of identifying outbreaks as they're happening. What's interesting, though, like a lot of the listeria outbreaks of late, the median age of the afflicted patients is their elderly, 72 years. And so again, for all of you that have grandparents, older friends, they need to understand their, their risk of listeriosis. There weren't any um, pregnant women or, or fetuses involved in this outbreaks. There was a cheese sample from the refrigerator of an ill patient that um, was purchased on February 13th. The patient was hospitalized, and investigators were able to go to the home of that hospitalized person and collect the cheese sample, and it revealed really high levels of listeria in the cheese, about two times 10 to the sixth, um, way above the infectious dose. There were 16 tons of quargel produced per week by an Austrian manufacturer, and this is a cheese made from pasteurized milk. It's made of curdled milk. It ripens for a day at 28 degrees centigrade after the addition of starter cultures. And then after two days at 14, it's sprayed with Brevibacterium linens as the ripening culture. And then the shelf life after packeting and marketing is two months. That's a big problem because what happens when you store listeria in the refrigerator? It grows. So even if you had low levels of contamination, 
over two months in a cheese like this, you're going to get huge populations. And again, like the Vacheron Montdor outbreak, there were two different outbreak clones, which usually indicates environmental contamination, sure enough. Um, environmental Listeria monocytogenes 12A was isolated from the production plant collected in December 2009, and it matched one of the outbreak strains, Clone 1, um, for 12 Austrian and two German cases. And then there was a second clone, also Clone 2, also a 12A strain, and that accounted for 13 different Austrian cases and six German cases. Um, and they had different onsets. There was a hypothesis from the people investigating this outbreak that Listeria was introduced into a plant where major construction work was going on between February and May, right around the outbreak period, and it involved remodeling of a ripening room. What we've seen in the United States most, if not all, with the exception of the Hispanic-style cheese outbreaks, most of the other outbreaks have always been preceded by some kind of construction event. So the take-home message is, when you're doing plant construction, don't be producing food in that plant at the same time, right? You'd think it's simple, but it happens over and over. In May of 2009, a smear fluid sample tested positive, and it matched 16 batches of the recalled cheese. Again, if that smear fluid gets contaminated, the game's over. Everything you smear is going to be contaminated. Um, there was a shift to a different outbreak clone in December 2009 caused by a change to a new commercial yeast ripening culture. Um, so how that became contaminated, who knows, probably from the environment. Again, you all know the EU requirements, no more than 100 CFU of listeria at time of consumption or not to exceed 100 CFU during its shelf life. Samples recalled after this outbreak, the highest value among the recalled cheeses was 2.8 times 10 to the eighth CFU per gram of cheese. So no compliance there, right? Just like Vittorio before he gets to, to the police this morning, right? So this is a huge problem. So we've talked a little bit about um, risk assessments, identifying hazards, identifying exposure, who's eating what food, um, what are consumption trends, looking at hazard characterization, what's the infectious dose of an organism, risk characterization, what foods cause listeriosis and their relative risk, and then risk communication. How do we get this information to populations that are at risk? And I should note, um, if you're looking for good educational information for consumers at risk, the US Centers for Disease Control just published an amazing um, listeria um, risk management um, pamphlet that is meant to go to physician's offices, nurse's office, to really give at-risk patients good information about listeria. And if you just go to cdc.gov and Google listeria, you'll come up with that educational information. It's just excellent. Um, Food Safety Australia New Zealand has done a series of really comprehensive risk assessments that have informed all of our knowledge. And again, when they go through the pathogens of concern, um, unlike the United States government, if you look at what FDA considers risk right now, there's a really long list, which I don't think is really accurate. I think Australia, New Zealand has done a much better job in identifying risk. Things like Campylobacter, you know, risk assessments have shown it's unable to survive processing and maturation, and so it has a negligible risk in cheese. Um, pathogenic E. coli, low risk if the level in milk is low, that's where you can control it. Um, the organism doesn't survive cheese maturation in many types of cheeses, not true for things like Gouda and cheddar, where it persists for a long, long time for reasons we don't understand. So you've really got to keep it out of milk at the beginning. Salmonella, um, the risk of raw milk contamination are low, which we've seen from data. Um, challenge studies document an activation during cheese making and ripening, again, for certain types of cheese, not for all of them. 
um, staph aureus, um, good control over acidification is necessary. If you have that, the risk is low. If you don't have that, the risk is high. Listeria, low negligible risk if the organism's not present in raw milk, but it requires effective control over cheese making and ripening operations, environmental control. Coxiella burnetti, um, this is the target for milk pasteurization, right, and rickettsia. Um, at Food Safety Australia, New Zealand says, you know, this organism isn't going to survive cheese processing. That's really not what either the UK or the United States government um, has concluded, and there are ongoing investigations of coxiella levels um, that are in milk. And then brucella, you still have brucella problems in certain parts of Europe, but in most places, um, as long as you're making milk from brucella-free herds, you can control the illness that way. So again, when we look at cheeses that carry more of a microbiological risk, the soft bloomy rind cheeses, soft natural tome style cheeses, soft washed rind cheeses that we've already talked about, and again, the 60-day aging rule applies to those cheeses, so our regulations are actually creating more risk than they should be. Um, and again, I've shown you the data that you see rapid growth of listeria in a soft-ripened cheese like camembert to about five times 10 to the seventh versus the marked decline in cheddar cheese that you see of this pathogen. We've already gone through that. Um, we did some recent studies using a camembert model, again, to just document if we're gonna change regulations, number one is let's get rid of the 60-day aging rule applied to soft ripened cheese because you're just creating more risk. It's also really important to understand the composition of the cheese that you're manufacturing. What's very interesting, and so what's happening now, um, FDA inspectors, I was just talking to a cheese importer before I came over here, and so how, how regulations kind of break down to where they're not useful is at the end of the day, there's always an end of one person that you're dealing with, right? So one FDA inspector who's just not getting all of this, because it's kind of complicated stuff, and he was challenging the importer, in that cheese, what's the um, percent water and moisture? And the guy's like, well, it's 100%, right? Like he's answering the question. And what the inspector was meaning to ask was what was the salt and moisture, but he doesn't even understand the question he's supposed to be asking. And so this, this is going on as we speak. So why composition is so important in terms of moisture content, water activity, percent salt and water, and ripening temperature, Camembert and feta have nearly identical composition, and you think about them as two very different cheeses, right? But composition-wise, they're almost identical, but feta has a pH of 4.4 that prevents listeria growth versus fully ripened camembert that has a pH of 7.5. So they're really different products. Again, we've already gone through our um, insistence that uh, raw milk really is, you know, raw milk from artisan producers really isn't the source of problems. From a listeria perspective, it's definitely your environment. Again, your EU microbiological criteria, I think, are very good regulations. Targeting E. coli is a hygienic index and Staph aureus. Um, and again, if you can maintain compliance of staph, all the measures that you're taking to do that do a pretty good job in controlling um, other pathogens as well. And then we've talked about our risk assessment activity. But again, the risk associated with raw milk cheese, there's a continuum there for um, the bloomy rind, washed rind, Hispanic and tome style cheeses, a very high risk because there's a low cooking temperature that's not going to inactivate anything, high moisture, high pH, perfect environment for the pathogens, versus um, hard Swiss and hard Italian cheeses, very low risk, high cooking temperature, low moisture, long aging. And so we can't just say cheese has risk, what type of cheese under what conditions. And we've been through all of this, and I apologize for some of the redundancy, but again, you'll see, you can see in our 
um, in our courses at the university, how we tie in the research data right into educational seminars. Um, the data that we found in terms of listeria incidence in manufacturing facilities is mirrored by findings of others. This was a publication in the Journal of Dairy Science. Um, the data that we've generated for the most part is from cow's milk dairies. This was um, samples from farmstead sheep dairies over a three year period. The prevalence rates for listeria were 9.4% for the farm and 2.7% for the cheese facility. Um, Nightingale et al. at Cornell University found a 22% prevalence of listeria on bovine farms and 16% on small ruminant farms, looking at the environments of those farm facilities. And again, you can't really read this. I'm going to leave these presentations behind if you want to make copies or distribute them. You're, you're welcome to do so. But again, identification of all of the places where you can find listeria. And the different boxes, you can see those shaded boxes. Once you get establishment of listeria, it's really, really hard to get rid of it. So once you identify those sites, you've really got to address them right away, because if you don't, um, the organism is incredibly persistent. And again, we've talked about the Food Safety Modernization Act. And again, um, education and being proactive is key. I will leave you with um, throwing out yet another conundrum. So what we know about um, organisms that exist in cheese is largely the result of cultural methods, right? We have, we're dependent on growing something out of a cheese to identify what's there. Now that we've got molecular tools and can target DNA, and we can use um, deep sequence DNA methods to find out the whole population, the whole microbial community that's present in cheese, suddenly gets really complicated. And so this was a publication out of Tim Cogan's lab in Ireland, looking at um, four different types of cheese. What were they looking at? The soft cheeses, semi-hard cheeses, hard, and cheese rinds. And what you see is a real complex diversity of organisms, some of which we would never associate with cheeses. We don't really know what their role is in these cheeses. We just know that the DNA is present. You can actually then culture these things out once you know what you have to target. But it's just going to, in terms of regulations, add a whole other layer of complexity. Um, there's some great work going on at Harvard University in the lab of Rachel Dutton. She's kind of taken this to a new level and can identify at least 30 species of organisms in most cheeses. And some of them are known pathogens. Um, it's just gonna, it's just gonna create more confusion, more opportunities for research, more opportunities for um, dialogue and interpretation. So we're gonna have a lot of fun with this as, as Food Safety Modernization Act moves forward with the complicated science and the complicated processing. We're all gonna be having lots and lots of dialogue about this and it's gonna be fun. So, so I'll leave you with that. Then I'm going to move into our Cheese Institute at the University of Vermont. So you can see, a, do you want to take a little bit of break? Is everybody ready for a five minute break? Perfect. <laughs> All right, should we get started? Good. So these next two presentations are gonna be more fun, kind of um, less science. I wanna talk a little bit about why we organized the Vermont Institute for Artisan Cheese. You can kind of see with the information that I've shown you. The problem is, in, in, we live in a very, I live in a very small state and people feel very connected. And so if you're a cheesemaker and you have a question, they'll pick up the phone and they'll call me and they'll start asking questions. Well, how do I control listeria? And you just can't 
you don't have the time to answer everybody's questions. And so we decided we should formalize an institute so we had a mechanism of providing education and providing scientific information to our cheesemakers. And so we formed the Vermont Institute for Artists and Cheese, we being myself and my colleague Paul Kinstead, those of you that followed the cheese literature, he's an expert on um, the chemical composition of cheeses and functionality. Um, but we thought we were only addressing the needs in our very small state of Vermont, 600,000 people. It's a really tiny state and 50 cheesemakers. We thought, how hard can this be? Well, it turns out no one um, in the United States is addressing the needs for artisan cheesemakers, so I'll kind of show you what happened next. So, um, the, the reason we established VIAC, what we call the Vermont Institute for Artisan Cheese, there was national demand for artisan cheeses. Consumers really, really want these products, and the cheesemakers are in a great, enviable position. There's a lot more demand for the product than there is supply, so there's a lot of room for growth of this industry, and that's true worldwide. There's regional demand for cheesemaking knowledge, workshops, and technical assistance. Essentially, no one was dealing with this population. The way we modeled our institute, you're so lucky here in Europe because you have um, research centers, they're operational in France, Switzerland, and Italy, kind of the regional consortium, the people that provide the PDO, right, designation, help provide a lot of technical support. We don't have that in the United States. And those so those centers served as nice models for us. Um, as you've seen, scientific and technical resources are really needed to ensure production of cheeses of consistent quality and safety. And luckily at the University of Vermont, we had both expertise and interest in artisan cheeses. And so one of our um, US senators obtained some funding to help get our institute started, along with the foundation, the Merck Pharmaceutical Company. Their family members lived in Vermont and were very passionate about artisan cheeses, and so they provided some of the funding as well. So again, the national and international scientific policy discussions surrounding cheese safety, global trade, regulations, um, all of those are, are hot topics. The need for research, particularly that focused on issues and challenges faced by small-scale cheese producers. And there's concern in our country and others when you have federal regulations. They're really written for large industries. And so if you have a cheese regulation, a company like Kraft, They've got 30, they, they've got way more than 30 PhDs. They've got a whole scientific and technical staff that can interpret and implement compliance with the regulations. What does small mom and pop do? They don't even understand, they can't even read the regulations and, and make any sense of them. And so there's a disparity. And our concern was, well, if no one addresses the needs of the small scale cheesemakers, regulations have a, a potential impact of getting rid of all those small-scale producers because they can't comply, and we don't want that to happen. So the Vermont Institute for Artisan Cheese became a national leader of the movement to preserve and expand America's small farm culture through the development and promotion of handcrafted cheeses and related dairy products. The mission is to strengthen artisan cheese making through research, professional, and public education and technology transfer. And our vision is to advance cheese making through access to science and technology in order to promote and sustain Vermont's rural working landscape, as well as rural landscapes nationally and internationally. And so we can all have a common conversation because the challenges we face are all the same. And this is actually Corfalac in Ragusa, if any of you know um, Giuseppe Lachitra and the good work that he's done that down there. And he's been a consistent collaborator with us. Our mission is to increase knowledge, appreciation, and expansion of artisan cheeses, to strengthen and develop artisan cheese making through scientific research, professional and public education, and technology transfer, and to encourage the sustainability of the small farm culture in Vermont and other rural landscapes. 
In the time that I've been a professor at the University of Vermont, over um, 30 years, we've probably lost 75% of the farms in our state. Dairy farming is really important, and farmers can't make any money. And so, where there used to be, you know, 3,000 farms, there may be 500 left. It's very sad. So we want to reverse that trend. Um, the institute is located at the University of Vermont, where it draws upon the university's faculty, facilities, and research capacities, as well as the reputation of the state of Vermont as a place committed to a healthy, natural, and sustainable way of life. And that's the way people around the globe are thinking about their food and where it comes from. We founded our institute in 2004, and it rose to national leadership because of the expertise of the faculty and staff, the uniqueness and appeal of its programs, the success of its promotion of artisan cheese, as well as the timeliness um, of our mission. And again, I serve as one of the co-directors of the Institute. My expertise is in, I'm a food microbiologist in food safety. My colleague Paul Kinstead deals with cheese functionality, cheese chemistry, and so it was a good mix of um, terms. We also had Monsi Almina, a sensory evaluation expert, and so she could lead a lot of our cheese tastings. Um, Dennis D'Amico was one of my former PhD students who did a lot of the risk reduction work. And then we had an administrative um, person, as well as a principal consultant who could help us do a lot of education. We offered two types of educational programs. One, the cheese making certificate program for beginning cheese makers. Again, a lot of the people that came to us don't have scientific backgrounds, and so our challenge was, how could we create a scientifically meaningful curriculum that someone that didn't have any background in science could come in and in two weeks leave with at least enough knowledge to understand there were risks they had to manage, there were targets they had to measure, and here's how you do consistent cheese. It's a huge challenge. We also offered an advanced cheese making certificate program for a different audience, people that had some experience with cheese making, but they wanted to know more about how to manage listeria in their environment. Um, we did a lot of cross-cultural and international ex exchange programs and had guest experts in our international artisan practices workshops. So we brought in experts from Spain doing a whole segment on Spanish cheeses, someone from Ireland that um, walked through a lot of the Irish cheeses, France, Switzerland, Germany, um, Italy, our, our friend Giuseppe. Um, we also believe that you help create more demand for cheese products when you educate consumers, and so we do a lot of public education programs, cheese tastings, and um, those ended up being really fun. Our cheese making certificate program, again, this intensive six course program for beginning cheese makers, that included the following topics, principles and practices of cheese making. So the students would spend three days in the cheese making room, we do three different types of cheese so they could um, understand the differences. We did hygiene and food safety. How do you do, put these controls in place so you can make a safe product? Milk chemistry and quality, understanding things like seasonal changes in lactation and how you make adjustments. We did a section on cheese chemistry and you know, sometimes the way the curriculum would work, we'd offer this over two weeks, so three courses the first week, three courses the second week, and there were some times where it just happened that, like, the first class that people are sitting in on Monday morning is cheese chemistry, and these people that were architects and bankers and lawyers, they're like, are you serious? It's like, trust us, we're gonna, this is chemistry made easy, so you can kind of take away something. We did a section on starter cultures, and um, we also did one on basic sensory evaluation. And so we felt like those were the topics that at minimum you had to cover. So at least you could produce a student who suddenly spoke the same language that we did. So when they had questions, we're all playing off of the same playbook in terms of um, understanding the questions. 
and then the advanced cheese making certificate was for more experienced people focused on the risk reduction practices that I talked about, cheese defects. Um, it was very fun because when you're having a class where you tell everybody, okay, the requirement in this class is you've got to bring your defective cheese to the class and share it with everybody. And so, you know, you'd have 20 people all sharing their defective cheeses and trying to do detective work on what went wrong. We had a course on affinage one on advanced sensory concepts, and then our international practices programs. And again, those um, were workshops featuring experts from Europe who shared cheese making techniques, experience, and best practices. Again, how we can all learn from each other. What amazed us was um, since 2004, over 2,000 cheesemakers and food professionals from 49 of the 50 states and 14 countries attended our programs. We started getting emails from India and Singapore and Korea and Japan as, you know, like, can we enroll in your classes? We're like, really? And, and people would just come from all over the country. Um, the students typically included individuals working in traditional agriculture who want to learn about cheese making to enhance the financial viability of the farm, land, or animals they already own. And this wasn't necessarily older dairy farmers, but maybe their sons and daughters who wanted to save the family farm, but knew that producing milk wasn't the way to do it, so they wanted a value-added product. The other group were highly successful individuals who completed a first career and sought a lifestyle change, so they didn't want to stop working. They just wanted to retire from their first job and thought a nice thing to do for a second job was to get animals, get land, and start making cheese. And we're like, really? This is really hard work. This is what you want to do. And those people ended up being surgeons, engineers, bankers, scientists, and others. And even the Wall Street Journal, our, our financial newspaper in the United States, came to write about this because they just thought it was a really interesting trend and it's something that's real and is going on. More than 500 individuals participated in our public education, our tasting programs, and they featured such renowned lecturers as Giuseppe Lachitra, he'd do From Lombardy to Sicily, The Landscape of Italian Cheese. Dr. Yolande Noel did French cheeses from the Loire Valley, French Alps, Normandy, and Roquefort. Um, wonderful, wonderful programs. We also um, authored many um, books. Um, so we write for a broad public and encourage the media to write about artisan cheese and related topics. Um, since 2005, three authoritative textbooks were authored by the Institute's faculty. Um, the Complete Guide to Making and Selling Artisan Cheeses by Paul Kinstead, The Atlas of American Artisan Cheese by Jeff Roberts, and Cheese and Culture, Paul's latest book. The American Farmstead Cheese book that Paul authored was the book that we gave all of the students in the classroom, so they had some kind of um, academic text to follow along. The media outreach that we did, um, there, to give you an idea of how much interest there is in artisan cheese production in the United States, one of the public relations firms that we worked with told us that in one year, our stories reached 40 million people. I mean, that, that's like mind boggling to me. We, we just get written up in all these um, pretty high level publications. And then we'd work with our groups of cheese producers. So we're scientists. Um, we don't have marketing expertise, but that's primarily why they existed. And so this is the Vermont Cheese Council that did some fun agritourism projects. So this is the Vermont Cheese Trail. So all of those numbers are farmstead cheesemakers in Vermont. And the, um, they worked with our Department of Tourism at the state to produce this map that they can give to tourists who wander on the Vermont Cheese Trail. And so they can go and visit all of these places, taste cheese, or even better, buy cheese. And it's a really nice way to facilitate agritourism. 
it's something you could do here in this region if you you know you're looking for ways to kind of promote your agricultural development this is a great guide today when i was touring around we see lots of people on bicycles those are the tourists that do the cheese trail in vermont um, it's a really great way to stimulate agritourism and again, um, you know, the Institute is an all fun. One of the reasons we created the Institute was what a great way to get people's attention so then you can start talking to them about risks. If we had said, you know, oh, come, the Institute's going to offer a program on food microbiology, everybody is like, how boring, you know. It's much more fun if you talk, well, let's learn how to make cheese and taste it and smell it and eat it and enjoy it. And then, by the way, there's sometimes some problems. And so you get their attention that way. And we talk about the same things that we've talked about already. We also try and do as much writing and publishing as we can, again, to share and disseminate information. This was a perspective um, published in the Journal of Food Science and Food Technology. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that publication of the American, of the, of the Institute for Food Technologists, which is the largest organization in the world of food scientists. And I was asked to write an opinion column that raw milk cheese can be produced safely Again, we've got a regulatory agency that doesn't agree with that point of view. And so anytime we can use a scientific forum to lay out the arguments for why we don't agree with this FDA position. And um, here are the reasons why raw milk cheese can be produced safely. Of course, it helps when you're a tenured professor and you don't have any, there's no um, threat of losing my job for expressing these opinions where Right, Fergal, you, you, uh, you, you can't freely, ex the opinions you express may not necessarily be those of Christian Hansen, although they could be, right? <laughs> but I'm more free to, to do something like that. So why, do, why is our, why, you know, why are we having these discussions? The public and the media are more interested than ever in high quality natural foods. We saw that at lunchtime, right? That's the trend. Um, you know, ecologically friendly products, natural ingredients, organic, those are the buzzwords. Demand for such foods is increasing. There is growing public interest in minimizing the carbon footprint of food and concern about health issues of mass-produced foods. And again, it's that pendulum kind of swinging in a different direction. Artisan cheese opportunities, the ability to meet growing consumer demand for return to the small farm cultures and locally produced foods. Um, that's something novel in our country that um, students like all of you in our country are really resonating with. Especially in our country, cheap food policies, over-reliance on terminal processes have made us ignore raw material quality. And it's why consumers in our country largely reject irradiated foods. They're, cons they're not concerned about the safety of the irradiated foods. They're concerned about the quality of, well, what happened to that food before it was irradiated and all the problems were solved. They don't want to eat food that's produced like that. So the demand for Vermont artisan cheeses outpaces the supply of these products because people can actually talk to a farmer, see a farm where this product is made, see the animals, and they're um, interested in that. Here's a quote from some of the cheesemakers that we work with. Having VIAC in our backyard is a huge asset for us. They provide a deep well of expertise to draw on as our business grows and develops. And we think they will play a key role in the development of the industry here in Vermont and across the country, whether it's salt and moisture analysis, questions of a technical nature, or a curriculum that addresses our diverse needs as a cheesemaking community, the Institute steps up to provide for us and the needs of cheesemakers present and to come. Um, a recent issue that came up were cheese mites. Um, there was a French mimole cheese that was denied um, importation into the United States because it was full of cheese mites. And suddenly, FDA's on a tear about mites and allergenicity issues. And, and you know, there, there's always something when you're dealing with cheeses. And so that's the end of the artisan cheese presentation. And then the final thing I want to talk about, and again, these are kind of all related topics. Um, let 
but something that's maybe relevant to Foggia and this whole region, how do you create a successful local food economy? Um, again, if you're shifting that pendulum back from industrial processes to small food entrepreneurs kind of taking over and producing food, um, what are some of the ingredients for success in these local food models? And I've been fortunate that in Vermont, there's been a model that's received a lot of national attention. It's called the Hardwick model. And so I'll just finish talking a little bit about this. Some of the drivers of the local food economy, we just talked about them, right? People want um, high quality natural foods. Um, they want to minimize the carbon footprint. They want sustainability. And so they want to, if they have a choice over the food that they consume, they're going to choose those foods that they perceive as natural, sustainable, green. Um, one of the problems in our country, and especially driven by the fast food industry, McDonald's and others in the United States, what um, supplying those types of fast food establishments has transformed agriculture in our country. So over the last several decades, three enormous changes in the structure and organization of animal agriculture occurred. Number one, intensification development of increasingly large confined animal feeding operations in which hundreds or thousands of like animals are reared in feedlots or enclosed housing units. From a microbiological perspective, it's a disaster. Decoupling the physical separation of the land area where the feed grains or other forage products are produced from the site where the food animals are reared and fed. And then finally, transport, huge increases in the distance of transport of both feed materials and marketable meat, me eggs, milk, dairy, and fish products. And I should add produce. Um, after the North American Free Trade Agreement, a, a majority of the produce consumed in the United States is coming up from Mexico and Central America. And with it are coming a lot of um, other problems. So huge transport information in our food, not the idyllic pasture scene that you as a consumer wants to envision when you're deciding to produce a food product. This is the reality of a feedlot, and it's not a pretty sight. And I think because of this, a lot of consumers are kind of rejecting consumption of those products because it's not a system that they want to promote for a whole um, number of reasons, not the least of which is um, this type of production system is responsible for 76 million cases of foodborne illness in the United States annually, 325,000 hospitalizations and 5,000 deaths. So the food might be cheap, but the aggregate costs associated with the system aren't cheap, and healthcare is just not sustainable in the United States and, and elsewhere. It's becoming really, um, really difficult. So um, there are also other public health concerns about the model of the concentrated animal feeding operation, the migration of chemical and infectious compounds from swine and poultry waste to soil and water near these concentrated animal feeding operations, things like antibiotics, pathogens, nutrients like ammonia, nitrogen, phosphorus, the pollution of our water bodies, pesticides and hormones, the solids, the feed and feathers, and then trace elements like arsenic and copper. There are all these adverse environmental and, and health consequences. And then you layer on globalization. Um, I'm sure all of you in this room are familiar with the melamine disaster in China, it's right? So we're gonna use um, melamine grind it into a, it's an industrial chemical, it's not a food grade substance by any stretch of the imagination, but when ground as a powder and put into food, it fools the protein test, right? So you're, you're getting a false reading on something that you think is a human protein, and it's not. It's a, it was added as an animal feed filler to keep costs low, but inevitably it wasn't just animal feed that was impacted, it was some human food. And so all of these things beg the question, um, where does our food come from and how is it produced? And increasingly those are questions that consumers, especially consumers with resources, they want to know the answer to these questions. 
So that brings us to Hardwick, Vermont. I told you I'd talk about the Hardwick model. A little town in, if you wanted to pick the geographically most difficult place in Vermont to get food to a market, this is where you would pick. It's like up on a mountain, it's not near any highways, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's, it was a former mining town and mining isn't an industry there. Large unemployment, very poor town, very small population, 3,000 people. But it was populated by some small producers who wanted to make the community vibrant and they decided we're not going to let economic forces that we can't control determine our fate. We're going to take control of our future and create our own little food economy, take care of each other. They um, developed a model of connectedness, so it's a philosophy based on soil to seed, crop to compost. It's a whole ecosystem's approach to agriculture and everybody that's part of this model buys into this whole way of producing food. The recipe for success that this group, very small group of individuals came up with, and, and I have to tell you, they're winning like national and international awards. One of our cheesemakers, their cheese just won best in show at the American Cheese Society annual meeting. Out of 3,000 cheeses, it was chosen as the best one in the United States. One of our brewers was just named on ratebeer.com as the top brewer in the world. This is in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> seriously, like the most geographically isolated place, except for maybe the north of the Arctic Circle, <laughs> Fergal, right? But what, what has driven this success? Cooperation, people not willing to compete with each other, but wanting to help each other and work with each other. Their connection to the landscape. Many of the individuals that are involved in this project um, or have inherited their grandparents' farm or remember summering with their grandmother on this beautiful lake that's nearby. They all have this passion for place, not unlike this region. There is an ecosystems approach that I talked about. People in this community make the difference. Um, they're very well educated. They have vision and they're willing to take scientific innovation and use it to their advantage. Their local solutions to their local problems became a national model being emulated everywhere. And it's just really refreshing to see that it can be done. And this, all of this success was built at the absolute worst time in our economy in the United States where we were slowly creeping out of a recession. But they've created all of this success despite economic forces all around them. So again, who are some of the people and what are the drivers? Um, there's a lot of discussion of the impact of public policy on local food systems. And so one of the driving forces of this effort is a person named Andrew Meyer. He was a former aide in the US Senate to Senator um, James Jeffords, who is a senator from Vermont. Andrew furthered his passion and dedication to family farms as an undergraduate student at the University of Vermont, which is where I first met him, as well as through his work on agricultural policy with US Senator James Jeffords. And it was through Andrew's efforts that we got the big federal grant to do our work in VIAC, and so everybody's working together. Andrew formed an organization called the Center for an Agricultural Economy. You can Google their site and find out what they're doing. Um, let's see if I can click it. Oops, there we go, make that go away. The Center for an Agricultural Economy is a nonprofit organization located in Hardwick, Vermont. Their work focuses on supporting and guiding the Northeast Kingdom and its gateway towns towards a sustainable, economical, and ecological food system. And so they have a board of directors and then invite the community to become members. They have mentorship programs, so um, farmers that are just starting out can be mentored with someone that's been successful. And again, they all share resources and ideas. So some of the companies that have emerged out of this include the Vermont Soy Company. Um, Todd Pinkham 
one of the principals of this company, cultivated an interest in value-added agricultural products specific to Vermont as an undergraduate at Johnson State College. With market demand for soy food steadily increasing, he furthered his studies at the University of Vermont with one of our food, functional food scientists, Dr. Mingru Guo, who was from China and had a lot of expertise in soy processing, soy productions, um, value-added products. So um, Dr. Guo taught Todd how to craft authentic tasting soy foods. So there are soy-based beverages, soy yogurt, other soy products. Um, so that's one of the great companies. Andrew also formed a company called Vermont Natural Coatings, which is a fabulous company. So what they do is take pol polymerized whey proteins and use these in wood finishes. So instead of industrial chemicals, you substitute some of the really toxic chemicals with hydro the, the poly whey. And so you've got an environmentally based wood finish. So you can apply this coating onto floors. It's like a polyurethane, only it doesn't contain any toxic chemicals. It functions just like polyurethane. It's very durable. But um, you can apply this wood finish and sleep in the room that same night because there aren't any odors, no off odors. And so um, Vermont Natural Coatings founder and president Andrew Meyer recognized the need for a better wood finish in Vermont's capacity to fulfill it. Meyer grew up on a dairy farm in the heart of Vermont's agricultural industry, armed with an environmental science degree from the University of Vermont, and entrepreneurial skill fostered through a decade of experience in agricultural and environmental policy development. Meyer built the facility and business that carries polyway coatings. And this product now, he's forming partnerships with the largest paint companies all over our country. Sherwin-Williams, huge, huge company. They're all, they've all got an interest in these environmentally sustainable products. And again, it emerged out of the tiniest little town that you can imagine. Another person um, formed Pete's Greens. Again, this whole fresh cut produce. I know that you have a lot of interest in this issue here. Um, Pete attended Middlebury College. He and his brother, his brother was an Olympic Nordic skier, you know, the cross country skiing. Um, they're all skiers, which is why they live in that area. So he went to Middlebury College and built a solar greenhouse on campus for his senior thesis. The experiments conducted there convinced him that greenhouse production of vegetables could help make farms profitable. We're talking about an area of the country where our, the day that we can plant seeds in the ground is May 30th, and the date where all the crops die is about September 15th. It's like the shortest growing season that you can imagine. So how you could ever build a successful business growing fresh produce in Vermont, again, it's amazing. And so he used greenhouse technology to figure out how to do this. Um, he, upon graduation, he returned to his parents' land in Greensboro, cleared three quarters of an acre to start his farm. Access to their tools, tractor, and land meant that he got a debt-free start in farming, which is unusual. Um, for the first four years, Pete's Greens produced only salad greens before they began to diversify, and now it's the largest community-supported agriculture organization in Vermont. Then we have High Mowing Organic Seeds, the largest organic seed company, again is located in this area in the middle of nowhere in Vermont. Tom Stearns is the founder of this company. He loves seeds. When asked what is it about seeds that makes him so passionate, he replies, I see seeds as one of the best educational tools. For me, I've seen myself as an educator more than anything else. I see my work focusing on helping people rebuild their local food systems. Seeds are an important yet easy tool to recognize the importance of these systems, and seeds are one of the mediums by which this message can be conveyed. To give you an idea of the type of attention um, high mowing seeds is getting, you see this um, White House garden seed packet. Michelle Obama, the wife of President Obama, has a White House kitchen garden to promote how you can eat you know, good quality food from your local garden. Guess where the seeds came from, from the White House kitchen garden. 
this little, well, this big seed company now in the middle of nowhere in Vermont. Again, all these people working together. And then finally, the sellers at Jasper Hill who have created an underground aging cave to do affinage. It's the only underground aging cellar in the United States, and um, their cheeses just continue to win awards. This Star Wars aging cave is, you know, up the mountain on the dirt road and down the end of the dirt road, and it's the most unlikely thing you ever think you're going to see, and there it is, and it's... Um, winning national awards. Again, the artisan cheese opportunities, the ability to meet growing consumer demand for return to the small farm culture and locally produced foods, the over-reliance on terminal processes and cheap food policies that have made us ignore raw material quality and the demand for these types of products. I'll give you an example. Can you see that price tag, $29? That's the cost per pound of this Cabot cloth bound cheddar cheese that's aged in that underground aging facility that I showed you. If you were gonna buy, so Cabot is a milk cooperative that's an industrial cheese maker. They, do, they have one, of, one single farm in their cooperative that produces the Cabot cloth bound cheddar that's manufactured at Cabot, but then it's aged in this underground aging facility. So you take a cheese that would normally retail for $6 a pound, and with the bandage wrapping and the affinage, you turn it into $29 a pound. It's pretty good economics. They can't make enough of this stuff. They just can't do it. They're, they're, they sell out of their cheese every year. Um, it's a fabulous cheese. They also make a Bailey Hazen blue cheese, um, and again, the idyllic setting. This is, this is the kind of product that consumers are wanting to buy. And again, VIAC works with all of these companies to try and you know, provide their, their technical assistance so that small companies can survive and thrive, and we've talked a little bit about VIAC already. And then um, I'm happy to say, you know, sometimes when you're a scientist, like you try and sit in the background and just be the objective, you know, publication writing, grant seeking person. But um, my husband and I became so excited about what was going on in this little community that's very hard to get to. And the other problem, if you're trying to run a business and now you're getting national and international attention, there's nowhere for anybody to stay, so people that are buyers and brokers, they want to come and visit, where are they going to stay? And so when the U.S. housing market crashed, this lovely inn went into foreclosure, and so my husband and I decided to buy it to help be part of this little model. And so now we have an inn that it's not a, it's not a traditional, it's not a nice place like where we're staying, where um, we're all housed to be here. It's an inn where everybody in those local food companies, they all have keys if they have, so right now I'm sitting here and there are people that I don't know staying in this inn that we own, but all of the food producers have keys to the inn. If they have a guest, they bring the person over and check them in. We have someone that manages, turns everything around. And so it's just a way, again, another missing piece of the food economy. Great, how can we provide reasonable housing so that cheese making interns can live there, business people that you know, wanna buy beer or wanna do technical symposia can all use this facility. And there's something about it, there's a saying in the United States, nothing breeds success like success. So when we were in the process of buying this in, we, of course, the bank owned the property because it went into foreclosure. The people that owned it went bankrupt and couldn't pay the mortgage. So in order to buy it from the bank, we had to write a business plan. And a business plan is, is just like a grant. What are you gonna do and how are you gonna generate revenue? We said, well, you know, we'll be housing cheese making interns and we're, you know, working with these local companies, but we'll also have guest chef come and do programs. And, and that was more like a vision. We didn't really know any guest chefs. Well, the first one that showed up is this guy in the middle. He's the most famous chef in the United States. His name is Emeril Lagasse. He has cooking shows all over TV. And again, 
he did um, the Discovery Channel in the United States rented the inn for 10 days and they filmed 10 different programs featuring Emerald Lagasse cooking with all the local food ingredients. So all the people I talked about, he used all of their products in his cooking. And you can um, Google Emerald Green Vermont and um, the, the Discovery Channel still has all of these programs um, online. So it just shows you how success breeds success. And, all of these guys just couldn't believe that here they are face to face. I mean, he's one of the biggest TV personalities in the United States. Everybody knows his name. And here he is. We convinced him to come to this little town in Vermont in the middle of nowhere up the dirt roads. Um, so it can be done. All of this creates opportunities right here. You know, you're. Um, I think when I was riding around with Vittorio, right, your wine production, you want to go from quantity to quality, and that's exactly the direction that this little community decided to do. They couldn't compete with, with quantity, and they decided go back to quality, produce those products that are in demand, and just the examples that I've seen all around, you have all of these opportunities right here, and it'll be up to can you organize people to kind of gather a common vision and create something different than is going on right now. And maybe it'll be more successful. You never know, but you're going to have a lot of fun trying. So what are the ingredients for a successful local food economy? People with, educational, with education and vision who are willing to work towards a common goal. It's a lot better to collaborate than to compete. The competition is the old model. Collaboration is the new model. A passion for place. I think that exists here. Everybody's very passionate about this area. Access to technological assistance, compliance with regulatory components. You've got a great university here. Local solutions to strengthen social and economic infrastructure. You've got a regional grant to do this program today. There's probably more of that type of money. And will you be the next success story? You never know, but you've got to start somewhere. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Who wants to be a food entrepreneur? We had lunch with some food entrepreneurs, right? Some of your former students that decided to run a restaurant. And that's what all of our students are doing now. It's, uh, going back and running farms and doing cheese making facilities, wine production. Someone's doing from apple. Do you grow apples here or is it too hot? What's the, it, it's too hot here for apples. Someone in, in our area um, takes apples and when they freeze, they're doing an ice wine out of the apple cider. It's a really nice product. It's very fun. You don't get freezing here. That's a good thing. You're lucky. <laughs> Great. Questions about Listeria or anything else? Again, I'll, I'll leave you with these presentations so you can use them. Great. Bini? <laughs> Uh, I was interested on um, uh, the aspect related to the use or uh, of raw milk for cheese production, because um, recently here in the Puglia region we had an outbreak of uh, E. coli O26 from uh, milk industry, uh, cheese industries who processed uh, cheese, mozzarella cheese with raw milk. So it's very actual uh, uh, issue for us. And uh, soon after that, uh, um, two different vision. Uh, one is from uh, Slow Food, uh, it, uh, Italian uh, network of uh, people working uh, for local food, typical food. Um, that was uh, perhaps too much uh, favorable to the use of raw milk. <laughs> and the other from industries and from some academics as well, who said, okay, we have to pasteurize. Food safety means kill everything perhaps also flavor and whatever. 
um, I think that in, in Italy, actually, the debate is very far to, to have a point of synthesis. And I really appreciated that you, that come from academic uh, uh, experience, are able to say um, is, it, it, it is possible, but not without scientific uh, knowledge of the, the phenomena. So, um, uh, Italian Society of Food Microbiology is now having a big debate with uh, slow food people about this. Uh, I don't think this is a good approach. And I'd like to, to know from you um, in which way uh, people from academic uh, can uh, uh, give argument to the public opinion, to cheese makers, uh, um, to make this uh, debate more, uh, less related to publications or uh, uh, this is my, mm, my question. Yeah. Yep. yeah, it's a great question. Um, and the problem is, as soon as you bring up the issue of raw milk, many times you get a very passionate debate that's not scientifically correct. So in the United States, there's a real push for people that want to drink raw milk and they want to promote, you know, just raw milk consumption. And there are certainly risks that go along with that. And from a public health perspective, I do not advocate um, raw milk consumption. I, and especially for the general population where 30% have some kind of immunocompromise, it's just not a good idea. The difference with cheese making, you know, cheese making was created as a way to take a raw product and process it for safety. What you have to do is control that risk of the sugar toxin producing E. coli. And so that's best done through monitoring raw milk. So if for every batch of cheese that you made, you have a test of your raw milk and you know, you know, it's several days um, or several months after you have that raw milk that you consume the cheese. And so in that long window, you've got the ability to generate test results, is that product contaminated or not? And so that could, for that, I don't know what type of cheese it was, but whatever it was, that could be part of the risk management strategy. We know this cheese can be contaminated. Gouda cheese, there have been several outbreaks linked to 0157H7 E. coli. Well, what does that mean? In some circumstances, maybe pasteurization is the tool used to target that organism. But there are other ways to do it as well. Um, what's causing the animals to become contaminated, to become infected, if you will? They can, they can be shedders of this organism. Okay, well, what are those factors and how can we control those? But it's got to be a scientific and not an, emo an emotional debate. And what you find in the United States, a lot of these people that are just passionate about raw milk, you know, especially fluid raw milk consumption for drinking, no matter what, they just ignore the science and it's just not a responsible public health approach. I think the whole risk management approach um, Great, so let's get the, the tools in place to identify the hazard and then how do we mitigate it. And pasteurization may end up being the most feasible for that particular um, cheese product. Or it could, be, it could be another way, let's test the milk, let's you know, test the animals, let's test the cheese on a periodic basis during its aging. Great, thank you. Catherine, sorry. Uh, do you think that um, food consultants uh, in this sector of safety should be a good uh, Trojan horse to start to dialogue, to collaborate with the uh, local uh, cheesemaker or uh, local uh, food produce, producer? Yeah, I think safety is a great topic to start that dialogue because um, you sh you'd rather, I would rather see you be proactive and start those discussions when the discussions usually happen is after the problem's already occurred and someone's become really sick or they've died. That's not the best time to do the education. It's a lot better to you know, reach out to say, 
we're trying, we know these things are happening, but we want to make sure we prevent them from happening here. So we found that in VIAC, it was a great way to reach out. You have expertise here in food microbiology and food safety. You can share that knowledge. There, how else are, are your local producers going to get that information, right? And then what it does is once you create that trust that, oh, well, we have some solutions to your problems, well, what else can we do together? So I think it's a great place to start. Many thanks. Thank you very much to You're be there. Welcome. Ancora grazie a tutti. Questo era il nostro ultimo appuntamento. Eh, aspettiamo i prossimi laboratori dal basso per uh, rincontrarci. Però la prossima volta applicherete voi. <ride> Buona serata a tutti, grazie.